Welcome to Korean True Crime with me, your host, Mimi Mizuko. In today's episode, we will discuss the concentration camp masquerading as a Christian welfare center, the Busan Brothers' home. The world has witnessed some of the most heinous crimes in history, and unfortunately, many of them remain hidden for years. The Brothers' home in Busan, South Korea is one of such cases. It was a facility that presented itself as a re-education shelter for the homeless, but in reality, it was a place of horror and abuse. Thank you, Vix Mack, Lala, Jay Colomo, Ben Jones, Ashley Rigby, William White, Sue VB Van Bremen, Blanca Blanca, G1 Edwards, Selkie, Nico, Elijah Hancock, Anominom, Dr. Bob, Black, and Lumos for their support on Patreon. Thank you for voting on today's episode topic. If you'd like to join my patrons, you'll receive ad-free early access episodes, weekly Korean true crime vocabulary hinting at the content of the next episode, exclusive access to vote on future episode topics, and occasional bonus content. There are no tiers, so all patrons gain access to everything. If you'd like to support me with your love, find me on most social media sites at Korean True Crime. Sources are available for free on Patreon. Today's episode contains especially heinous violence towards children and adults in the confines of a concentration camp. Listener discretion is advised. During the 1980s, South Korea experienced significant economic growth, but the aftermath of the Korean War left many citizens with unhealed trauma. The country was also under the military dictatorship of President Chun Doo-won, who presented a happy and prosperous image to the world while treating his people as dispensable. Today's episode focuses on the mistreatment of those undesirables. South Korea, as a developing nation under capitalism, sought to showcase its success to the rest of the world, especially since they were going to host the 1986 Asian Games and then the 1988 Summer Olympics in Seoul. President Chun Doo-won was determined to prevent the large impoverished population from embarrassing the country, leading to a very vague ordinance that treated impoverished people like litter. Ordinance 410 was known as the Social Purification Project, but people would later call it the Gangster Cleanup Plan, and it ultimately resulted in the creation of concentration camps. President Chun Doo-won issued a letter to Prime Minister Nam Duk-woo in 1981, instructing national authorities to quote-unquote crack down on beggars and provide protective measures for vagrants. However, this ordinance was intentionally vague and portrayed vagrants or impoverished people as if they were trash that needed to be cleaned off the streets. Specifically, the term used to describe impoverished people was the socially ill. The ordinance issued by President Chun Doo-won categorized crimes by severity, and the most severe cases were sent to military court, totaling an estimated 3,200 people. The largest group targeted were those alleged to be beggars, pickpockets, thieves, or gangsters, which often just meant they had tattoos. The punishment was a re-education program aimed at socially purifying offenders. However, the arrests made by militant authorities were often inconsistent, reckless, and groundless. In total, over 60,000 people were arrested under this ordinance. Outside of the ordinance, as part of the country's massive purification, over 700,000 people were forced out of their homes and relocated to former military barracks nationwide to destroy old buildings or move impoverished people away from tourist areas. Additionally, President Chun Doo-won ordered the closure of restaurants that sold dishes, including dog meat, to avoid criticism from international tourists. To this day, however, the Korean government has been unsuccessful in ending the practice of dog and bear farms that have inhumane practices. So, in 1981, the government initiated the program to transport beggars and vagrants to welfare centers, and the buses that were used were labeled with signs that read, Vagrant Transportation Vehicle. The government advertised the program as a caring initiative to help those who are homeless, troubled, or struggling to adapt to the military dictatorship's expectations. Large cities like 
like Seoul and Busan were targeted first, and propaganda advertisements were broadcasted on television, announcing that the program was a year long and participants would receive clothing, food, housing, and training to reintegrate into society. However, in reality, the program was far from what was advertised. Most participants did not willingly join, and those who did were lured by the promise of consistent meals and housing. Moreover, nobody was released after completing a one-year program. These nice welfare centers were just the same military barracks that were being used to house those who were forcibly relocated, and the training provided was just abusive physical labor. The survivors of these welfare centers turned concentration camps have come forward to share their stories and demand justice for what happened to them. The survivors' harrowing experiences have been brought to light through numerous interviews with media outlets such as BBC, Al Jazeera, Korea News Sources, and independent journals. However, their stories contain disturbing details of torture, sexual abuse, and death. And therefore, I once again want to remind you that listener discretion is strongly advised. The most notorious welfare center that took people in forcibly was the Busan Brothers Home. Though thousands of people were brought to this center, less than 10% of the inmates were homeless or had begged on the streets. Many of them had homes, had jobs, or were children. But this didn't matter to the authorities who arrested them. It's important to note that the brothers' home had been in operation since 1975 and was not a result of Ordinance 410. This welfare center merely took advantage of the government funding because of the ordinance. At a local police station, a nine-year-old boy named Han Jung Sun and his older sister waited for their father to return from running errands at the market. Their father had left them at the police station, assuring them that they would be safe there and that he would return when he was done. However, shortly after his departure, a truck arrived and the siblings were forced into the back of it. Jung Sung cried and hugged his sister, but a guard slapped him so hard that he passed out. When he regained consciousness, he found himself in a large building with a group of adults and children, where they were ordered to strip naked for a physical examination. The authorities were looking for tattoos, which were one of the identifiers that could result in arrest under Ordinance 410. Those who protested or resisted the examination were brutally beaten in front of everyone. After being separated from his sister, Jung Sun was placed in a children's unit, while his sister was sent to a women's unit. However, she refused to give up on reuniting with her brother and attempted to escape multiple times, only to be brutally punished and beaten each time she was caught. Despite the torture inflicted on her, she persisted in trying to rescue him. As a final punishment, she was transferred to a psychiatric unit, where she was given chlorpromazine, also known as Thorazine, an antipsychotic medication typically used to treat hallucinations and self-destructive behavior. While this medication is helpful when prescribed appropriately, misuse of the drug can result in serious side effects such as insomnia, dizziness, and even delusions. According to Han Jung Sun, after his sister was forced to take this medication, she began experiencing psychiatric problems and was no longer able to visit him. Left all alone, Jung Sun witnessed unimaginable horrors. In one instance, a young boy in his unit had an epileptic seizure, but the guards did not believe him and beat him with a wooden baton. When the boy regained consciousness and begged for mercy, the guard struck him in the head one last time, causing him to collapse and bleed to death from the wound struck to his head. The guards took the boy's body away without facing any consequences for killing the boy. Another survivor who was taken in 1982 a 14-year-old boy named Choi sung Woo was walking home from school when a police officer stopped him suddenly. Standing at the train station, sung Woo was accused of stealing a piece of bread that his parents had packed him for lunch. The officer, who targeted sung Woo for being unaccompanied by an adult, refused to believe the pleading boy and loaded him into the back of a truck that had been assigned to the officer to collect vagrants. Sungu was the officer's first victim of the day, and as he was forced into the back of the truck, he found himself alone in the dark. The officer then took out a lighter and began to burn the boy's testicles until he confessed to the theft. Sungu pleaded guilty to end the torture and was taken just a few minutes drive away to the brother's home. When the truck doors opened, sung was greeted by a massive iron gate and a concrete wall stretching as far as his eyes could see. It resembled a prison or a concentration camp. He was taken to an empty room for a physical examination, just like the rest of the boys. 
Although not in the same barracks as Jong Sun, Sung Woo was also imprisoned in the same compound at the same time. The compound, though, was massive, with 20 factories operated by prisoners and housing between 3 to 4,000 inmates at any given time. Two days after his arrival, the unit leader demanded that Sung Woo strip naked in front of all of the other inmates in his barrack. The leader then roughly washed him with cold water and instructed him to lay down on the bed. Sung Woo reported that the leader sexually assaulted him and caused severe injuries to his anus. Sung Woo was detained at the brother's home for four and a half more years until its closure. He was sexually assaulted almost daily by unit and group leaders, as well as by other inmates who formed gangs within the prison. At first, he attempted to report the abuse to military officials who visited the home, but he was punished for his efforts. In his third year at the prison in 1985, while eating in the cafeteria, Sung Woo recognized a familiar face at another table. It was his younger brother, who was now 14 years old, the same age Sung Woo was when he was taken to the prison. His brother had been taken when playing games alone at an arcade, another victim of groundless accusations of vagrancy. Despite being reunited, Sung Woo was unable to protect his brother and seldom had the opportunity to even see him. They had witnessed friends and family members being beaten for familiarity, so they kept their distance and merely had to acknowledge each other in silence. Not all of the prisoners at Brother's Home were forced to go into the welfare center. Kang Shin Woo, a 23-year-old man and a survivor, did not get taken there by the police, but instead, he checked himself in. Before Shinu discovered Brother's Home, he had a loving partner, and together they had a 10-month-old baby. His life was headed in the direction he wanted when suddenly a tragic car accident led to the death of his partner and their child. He found it impossible to recover emotionally from the loss and turned to drinking, which led to his downward spiral. It was during this period that he met a Korean Christian missionary. I use the term Korean Christian missionary since in Korea, Christian groups are often perceived as predatory in their tactics for recruitment and frequently exhibit cultish behavior. They don't typically behave in the same manner as other international Christian churches. I myself am not a Christian, so I state this as objectively as feasible without judgment, but with concern for those who have fallen victim to financial scams and emotionally manipulative doomsday rhetoric. Some of these cults in Korea include Shincheonji, Grace Road Church, Providence, World Mission Society, Unification Church, also known as the Moonies, Salvation Sect, and Five Oceans. So if you ever hear from these churches, steer clear. Perhaps we should consider producing an episode on some of these cults in the future. Seme M Church, one of the largest churches in Busan in the 80s, approached Kang Shun Woo. They offered to pray for him and invited him to join their community for support. The missionary was really kind and Shinu agreed to join the church. The actual church was beautiful and massive, with a huge white structure adorned with the ubiquitous red cross found all over Korea. At the front of the church, there was a large elevated podium and the pews could seat up to 3,500 people. Shinu was eager to join the program, believing that it would help him get his life back on track and feel normal once again. However, he was unaware that the inmates at Brother's Home had built the church through forced labor, toiling from dawn till dusk every day. Among the churchgoers he sat with were the prisoners, who had been coerced into the church's beliefs. The church stood just on the edge of the Brother's Home compound. According to Shanu, after joining the church, he soon realized that if hell existed, this was it. The behavior of the missionary and staff at Brother's Home towards him changed abruptly. He was no longer treated as a guest, but was instead treated as a prisoner. Immediately, he was forced to work at a construction site, breaking stones with his bare hands, without any explanation for why he was being held against his will. If he asked questions or attempted to leave, he would be met with violent beatings. But Shinu had a job and a home outside of the compound, but in a matter of hours, he lost everything. He tried to argue and retaliate, but five other inmates beat him into submission at the orders of a gang leader who maintained order in that part of the facility, likely in exchange for better treatment from the guards. They tied him up and smashed his head into the concrete, leaving him unconscious. Although he received medical treatment, he was still in a coma for a week. When he woke up, the beating resulted in permanent paralysis of his left arm and leg. 
As Kang Shenu continued to argue and resist his treatment, he was placed in a psychiatric ward and forced to take CPZ, the same antipsychotic drug that Han Jong Sung's sister was forced to take. Shenu reported feeling dazed and out of touch with reality for the next two years that he was forced to take this medication twice daily. Even before the experiences of Shenu, Jung San, and Chun Jae, there was Huang Jumbo, who had his own traumatic experience in 1976 at the age of 11. Prior to the implementation of Ordinance 410, Brothers Home operated similarly, but without government funding. Jungbok had become separated from his mother in a bustling crowd at Busan train station. He sought help from a police officer, but unfortunately, the officer did not assist him. Instead, he forcefully took him to the brother's home, where he was dropped off like garbage. Jungbok was given a medical examination upon arrival at the brother's home, and like all the other inmates, was dressed in a blue tracksuit and a cotton prisoner uniform with a sewn-on identification number. The boys and men had their heads shaved and were photographed with their identification numbers. Jungbok, along with the other survivors, worked tirelessly from dawn till dusk, with the younger boys performing physical labor. The boys were made to carry heavy sacks of sand weighing 20 to 30 kilograms, or 45 to 65 pounds, to construction sites for the church and barracks that were being built at the brothers' home. This grueling work was particularly difficult for the younger boys, who were forced to work without breaks. Jumbok remained at the brothers' home for a decade until he was finally free in 1987 as a 21-year-old man. During his time, Jumbok said that he could watch as newly kidnapped boys lost their will to survive. As he walked one day to the cafeteria to eat the often rotten moldy food, he saw one of his unit mates suddenly begin to sprint up the building stairs to the rooftop. The boy ran without hesitation and jumped off of the roof landing on his head, ending his life at the feet of Jungbok. While Jungbok was in prison, he was forced to work at several different factories. Within the brother's home, there were clothing factories as well as ones producing toothpicks, stationery, and fishing rods that were intended to export overseas. Women's experience within the home wasn't much better. Bak Sung Yi's experience at Brother's Home was a nightmare she could never fully escape from. At the age of 10 in 1980, she waited for her older brother at Busan train station, where police often took children for their brother's home. Two officers approached her and asked if she was lost, and when she said no, she was waiting for her brother, they insisted on helping her find him. Instead, they took her to a truck with other crying children inside and transported her to the brother's home. Like the boys, her hair was cut and she was given an identification number. Her clothes also had her identification number stamped onto them, a blue tracksuit, underclothes, and white canvas shoes. She would wear this exact outfit for the next six years. Inside her barrack building, there was a disabled woman who had been previously homeless. One day, she had a bathroom accident and required assistance. However, one of the leaders grabbed her by her hair and forcefully dragged her to the toilets before pouring freezing dirty water over her body and then mopping her. Despite witnessing the brutality, the other women were too afraid to intervene, knowing the potential consequences. Sun Hee, like many others regardless of gender, suffered sexual assault during her time at the brother's home. Gangs formed within the walls and the leaders of these gangs, known as commander leaders, gained privileges from the guards. At just the age of 17, during her sixth year of imprisonment, Sunny was sexually assaulted and became pregnant by a commander leader. Despite the trauma, she did not lose her will to survive and managed to escape from the brother's home with all of her strength and bravery. Others attempted to escape as well. Yi Chae Shik, a 15-year-old that had been at the brother's home for two years at this point, attempted to escape in 1983. He had been planning his escape and decided to climb the concrete walls to freedom. As he reached for the ledge, he felt excruciating pain and saw blood dripping down his hands. The top of the wall had been lined with shards of glass. When he fell, a guard caught him and ordered other inmates in the area to take turns beating him as a punishment. After enduring more verbal and physical abuse, Cheshik was brought before director Park In Kun, the leader of the church. He was forced to work harder and endure even more abuse as punishment for his supposed sin against the church. 
However, he was eventually selected to sing in the church's choir, which gave him more opportunities to interact with Pastor Im Young Sun. It was during this time that Cheshik discovered that the church was involved in Korea's international human trafficking, which was disguised as an international adoption business. Newborns and small children were brought to the brother's home only to suddenly disappear. As part of his duties, Cheshik was responsible for writing thank you letters to donors who had adopted children. Many of these children had been kidnapped or born from forced pregnancies. Yang Hyun Sun was another one of the few inmates who worked closely with the management, particularly with director Ju Jong Chan and his wife, for whom she worked as a nanny and a maid. She spent her days preparing their meals, taking care of their baby, and cleaning their home at just 10 years old. She had been taken from the streets and had no access to education or pay. As she worked, she observed how director Park in kuns daughter, who is the same age as her, would go to a normal school and live a completely different life than her. While the families of the management enjoyed luxurious meals and comfortable living conditions, Hyunsan slept on a moldy mattress, ate plain rice, and often had to eat moldy or rotten food. But the outside world had no idea what was happening. When donors and officials came by the house, well-balanced meals were served and only the best-behaved prisoners were allowed to be seen. They were made to perform military drills and show off for the guests how great the brother's home was until they all had to return to the horrors of the reality. In early 1986, as the closure of Brothers Home loomed, the families who owned the church and the institution decided to immigrate to Australia. Yang Hyun Sun was sent back to the women's unit while director Ju Chung Chan and his family moved away. Not all prisoners stayed in Korea when Brothers Home started to close. Im Bong Kun was forced to migrate to Australia alongside other inmates on non-work visitor visas and made to work illegally at director Park In Kun's golf driving range in Sydney. He toiled from sunrise until midnight for six days a week and received only cigarettes and food rations. Although the family was not always present in Australia, whenever any of the director's families came to visit, he was beaten ruthlessly. This resulted in him sustaining a permanent knee injury. As director Park beat him or other family members beat him, including his children, everyone just watched. Of the people observing the brutal beatings inflicted upon Im Bong Kun by director Park In Kun was Park Ji Hee, the youngest daughter of director Park. As of 2021, she holds a position of director at the Milpera Golf Range in Sydney. In 1987, the brother's home was ultimately shut down after being accused of misinterpreting Ordinance 410 and embezzling government funds. Despite the numerous cases of kidnappings, murder, abuse, and torture, no charges were made against the institution for these heinous acts. The final decade of the institution's operation saw the death of over 500 people, with all of the cases being declared as suicides, accidental deaths, or natural causes with no fault placed on the brother's home. Director Park was sentenced to two years and six months in prison for embezzling 1.2 billion won or approximately 3.5 million USD in today's currency. Other leaders and pastors were also handed prison sentences for crimes like special confinement and embezzlement. Following the closure of the Busan brothers' home, many inmates were left without a home. Han jong Sun, who was previously separated from his sister, was once again separated from her and sent to different orphanages. Due to a lack of psychiatric care, jong Sun struggled to cope with his PTSD that he was experiencing. He became extremely self-destructive and aggressive, feeling that he wanted to harm anyone and everyone around him because nobody believed him or cared about his story. However, instead, he chose to stage a year-long protest alone in front of the National Assembly, holding up signs with details of what he had experienced and witnessed in the brother's home. Han stated in an interview with Al Jazeera that, We were already labeled as vagrants all of our lives. We didn't need to be labeled as psychopaths as well. He was unwilling to forget any details of the story that many refused to believe. He has dedicated his life to fighting for the justice for the wrongs done to him and so many others at the Busan Brothers' home. He even builds miniature models of the barracks and creates drawings of incidents from his memory. 
He was eventually reunited with his sister and father, who had not abandoned him or sent him to the home. When their father did return, he discovered that his children had been taken away from him. Sadly, his sister was not able to overcome the trauma that she endured and still receives full-time psychiatric care. Han says, We were victims of the government's bid to purify the streets ahead of the Olympics. We were swept away like trash. Despite the government's attempts to sweep their experiences under the rug, Han and others continued to speak out and demand recognition for the horrors that they endured. He believes that the South Korean government must acknowledge their wrongdoing and ask the victims for forgiveness. In the years leading up to the closure of the welfare center, there were rumors circulating about abuse, kidnapping, illegal detention, and even deaths taking place inside the brothers' home. Some attempted to escape, and a few people were successful. The Te brothers' family was one of those people who heard the rumors and believed that their missing sons must be in the brothers' home. And they were right. They had previously reported their disappearance to the police, but the police were less than helpful. However, the boy's father was determined to find his sons and went to the brothers' home to demand their release. At first, the guards denied that the brothers were even there, but after the father persisted and made a huge scene, it caused the guards to finally release the two boys. As they were brought to the large iron gate, Sungu, who is now 19 years old, weighed only 37 kilograms, or 81 pounds. He saw his brother, and the two boys wept in disbelief. Sungu's 17 year old brother weighed only 35 kilograms, or 77 pounds, highlighting the dire conditions that these boys had been subjected to during their stay at the brothers' home. The impact of their time in the brothers' home was long lasting for the Che brothers. Even after being released, they struggled to adjust to their newfound freedom. They were uneducated, suffered from PTSD, and felt lost to society. Che Sung Woo turned to a life of gang involvement while his younger brother battled depression. And tragically, in 2009, Sung Woo's brother took his own life. Sung Woo was the one that discovered his brother and had to grieve for hours holding his brother's body before seeking help. The loss of his brother was a big turning point for Sung Woo. It ignited a passion for him to seek justice for the wrongs done to him and his brother at the brother's home. He teamed up with Han Jung Sun to propose the revisitation of the case, which was finally passed in 2020, leading to the establishment of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The two have since been on a mission to find other survivors and share their stories. However, many of the former inmates were unable to readjust the society and were left homeless and voiceless. After being released from the brother's home, Kang shen Wu was transferred to a local hospital in Busan where he contacted his father who had been searching for him. Together, they sought justice for the abuse he had suffered. Kang wrote a detailed three-page affidavit outlining the horrors he had experienced at the home. However, the director of the brother's home, Park in kun had powerful connections within the government, which had signed contracts to send vagrants to the home. Despite Kong's effort, the government found Park not guilty of illegal confinement due to Ordinance 410, which allowed for the abduction and detention of vagrants. He was only found guilty of embezzlement during his trial. After escaping from brother's home, Park Sun E was reunited with her family as well. However, she now had a criminal record, was pregnant, and felt ashamed of what had happened to her. She decided to give up her baby for adoption overseas following the advice of her mother. Brother's home presented itself as this benevolent institution with a strong adherence to Christian principles, but in reality, it just used religion to justify the mistreatment of its prisoners. Every day, their routine began at 5.30 a.m. with religious hymns and a sermon by the then director and pastor, Im Young Soon. Inmates who didn't pay attention during service were beaten with wooden batons. If any prisoner misbehaved during service, the entire barrack was punished by being forced to sing hymns throughout the entire night. Inmates were also forced to participate in the church's religious activities and were forced to dress up and reenact biblical scenes for domestic and international guests, who were often sponsors of the brothers' home. Inmates were forced to showcase their supposed transformation due to the church's teachings and re-education program, all while concealing the torture and abuse that was occurring behind closed doors. According to a DW News article, Brothers Home was responsible for the deaths of at least 516 people in the last two decades. 
In the 1990s, construction workers tearing down the brothers' home compound discovered roughly 100 sets of human remains. The estimated number of people who died in the brothers' home is much higher. After brothers' home closed in 1987, the church shifted its focus to opening new businesses. The church's leader, Director Park Inkun, and his family established businesses in Australia and remain there to this day, presumably to avoid facing charges for their crimes. Following Park Inkun's release from prison, he sold the land where Brothers Home stood, which was subsequently converted into apartment complexes. Despite this, the Brothers Welfare Support Foundation continues to exist in Busan, and Director Park Sung operated a nursing home for disabled individuals called the House of Shidol Am until 2016. More recently, the abandoned brother's home building has become a popular destination for YouTubers seeking a haunted experience. The atrocities committed at the brother's home are a dark stain on the history of South Korea. The survivors have shared their stories, and it is important that we listen and acknowledge the pain and suffering that they endured. It's also crucial that justice is served for the victims and their families. The establishment of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in 2020 was a step towards this goal, but more needs to be done. We must not forget the lessons of history and continue to work towards creating a society that values human rights and dignity for all. Let us hold on to hope that the survivors of the brothers' home will receive the justice they deserve and that their stories will serve as a reminder of the importance of preventing such atrocities from happening again. I hope you enjoyed today's episode topic. If you'd like to vote on future episode topics, join Korean True Crime on Patreon today. Thank you for listening to Korean True Crime. If you'd like to hear more, follow the show wherever you listen and be sure to leave a review. If you'd like to send feedback, find me on all social media sites at Korean True Crime. See you next time.